Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be doing an analysis on Booking Holdings, which is an online travel agency. I'm going to be doing a deep dive and consider all of the relevant qualitative and quantitative factors that come into play when I'm estimating a buy price. Before I begin, the main point of these stock analysis videos is so you can understand the process that I go through in order to try and understand the company and how I ultimately come to a conclusion about whether it's possible to invest in this company or not. And this is done so you can feel confident about doing the research yourself. I believe the best way to tease something is by showing a demonstration. And in this video and other stock analysis videos, I show a demonstration on how I go about my own research process. And I have always learned best and felt confident doing something when someone has shown me how to do it since I get the chance to see the process of how they have ultimately formed their opinion about a company. So in saying that, you can use this video as a way to complement your research if you have already analyzed this company. However, don't use this video as a way to supplement your own research. To begin, we're going to be looking into our four Buffett and Munger principles. And the first is, do we understand the business? How does the business generate revenue? So what is it that they are trying to sell? What industry are they in and who are their competitors? Next thing we will consider is the management team. Are the managers able and honest? The biggest indicator that suggests a capable management is, is how effectively do they allocate capital? Do they waste money on projects or acquisitions that are unrelated to the business and bring poor returns to their investment? Or do they allocate capital efficiently? The best way to determine this is to look at the return on investor capital, which we will look at later. Next is, do they have a competitive advantage? Is there anything about booking holdings that differentiates them from their competitors? If a business has sustained a high return on investor capital, usually around 15% or more over a long period of time, then this is a good indicator that suggests a business does have a competitive advantage. So we will look into this. And lastly, is it selling within our margin of safety? And the purpose of these principles is to help us answer two overarching questions. And the first is, is this business sustainable? Will the business still be around in 10 years or more? And if the answer is yes, will it be thriving? Will the business be in a better position 10 years compared to today? And then we need to figure out what is the business worth today? What is an appropriate price that we can pay that can give us a good return on investment in the future? And the price that we pay needs to account for any errors we make in our estimates since we can never be precisely right. And that is why we have a margin of safety. So as I mentioned before, Booking Holdings is an online travel agency and they mainly generate revenue when customers book accommodations on their platforms. The customers can also book flights, car rentals and taxis on their platform as well. Think of Booking Holdings as an intermediary that connects the supplier to the customer. And in this case, the suppliers are the hotel chains, the airlines, and the taxis, and the customers are anyone who wants to make a booking. Booking isn't just one brand, it's a parent company that owns a variety of brands, such as Booking.com, RentalCars.com, Priceline, Agoda, Kayak, and Open Table. Booking is where you go to book online accommodations, Rental Cars offers online car reservations. Priceline offers hotel, flight, activity, and rental car reservations. Kayak is an online meta search, which is a way for customers to search and compare travel and airline prices. Agoda, you can also book hotel reservations there. And Open Table is where customers book restaurant reservations online. So there is a lot of interplay between these brands. Since they all offer similar services, but they are all owned by the parent company called Booking Holdings. Booking categorizes their revenue as agency, merchant, and advertising and other. Agency revenue is when they act as an agent in the transaction. They make the reservation, but they don't collect the payment. The suppliers follow up with the customers themselves to facilitate the payments. Booking earns a commission every time they make a reservation for their suppliers. Merchant revenue is when they actually collect the payments from the customers and transfer the payments to the suppliers. They also earn a commission on that as well. And advertising is a small component and this is when they send referrals to suppliers on their Kayak platform. 
So when a customer searches for airlines and accommodations on Kayak, they pay Kayak so they can advertise their listing on a platform. I'm going to pretty much disregard the advertising category because Kayak's meta search competitor is Google Flights and most people just go on Google to compare cheap flights and hotels. However, in saying that, this only affects their meta search advertising business since Google doesn't make any reservations or facilitate any payments. They only send referrals either directly to a hotel or through an online travel agency like Booking. Some may view Google as a competitor in this way, but this actually helps Booking increase their agency and merchant revenue since Google Flights often place Booking in their search results. Google is an advertising business with a huge moat, so I don't expect Kayak's advertising business to grow at all. The focus is strictly on the agency and merchant categories. So if we have a look at this data, in 2014, agency makes up most of their revenue. And as the years have gone on, merchant has slowly been increasing as a proportion of their total revenue towards the end of 2022. By the way, the 2023 results isn't out yet. So merchant revenue has slowly been catching up. And this just means that booking is facilitating more payments for their suppliers. But the drawback is that merchant revenue reduces the overall margins for the business since this comes at a greater cost. It says that Booking.com increasingly processes transactions on a merchant basis, where it facilitates payments from travelers for the services provided. However, this results in additional expenses for personnel, payment processing, chargebacks, including those related to fraud, and other expenses related to these transactions. To the extent more of our business is generated on a merchant basis, we incur a greater level of these merchant-related expenses which negatively impacts our operating margins despite increases in associated incremental revenues. So we can see that as merchant revenue is increasing as a proportion of revenue, operating margins has been decreasing over time. 10 years ago, the operating margins was at 42%, whereas now it's at just under 30%. But in saying that, overall revenue has been growing steadily, except from the COVID impact in 2020, but they have recovered and improved from their pre-COVID levels in 2019 and 2022. So in other words, we can see that in 2022, revenue is higher than it was in 2019 before the pandemic happened. Being an online travel agency, they spend a lot of money on marketing to bring awareness to the customer. It is a very big industry and all competitors spend a lot of money on marketing for awareness. Marketing expense as a percentage of revenue has consistently hovered around the 35% mark. The number of room nights booked has increased over time too, and similar with revenue, in 2022, room nights of 896 million has exceeded the room nights in 2019, which was before the pandemic. By the way, so whenever a customer books a room for a night, that counts as one room night. If we look at the number of properties listed on their platform over time, with 850,000 properties listed in 2015 to 2.7 million properties listed in 2022. These properties consist of 400,000 hotels, motels and resorts, and 2.3 million listed as alternative, which includes homes, apartments, and other unique places to stay. But the interesting thing with this is that even though there are only 400,000 hotels listed in total, that park comprises of 70% of their room night mix which means that most of their reservations are hotel reservations and not their homes and apartment listings. I'll explain why this is interesting a little bit later. If we look at the industry, the online travel market is very big at $475 billion at the end of 2022, and Booking.com is the largest online travel agent. With that in mind, the online travel industry is still expected to grow at a fast rate, with the market expecting to reach a trillion by 2030. That's just over a 10% growth rate for the industry. Booking Holdings isn't the only online travel company. There are a lot of competitors with the largest competitors being Expedia and Airbnb. And this is where it gets interesting between these competitors because they all offer the same service and Expedia has a big portfolio of different online brands making reservations that is very similar with Booking. All three of these companies are online travel agencies and you can make a booking using any one of their platforms. However, there are some unique differences between the three. First, if we look at Expedia's revenue by location, 
Most of their revenue is in the United States, and if you look at their website traffic, 88% of their total website traffic is in the United States. This is very similar with Airbnb, 71% of their website traffic in the United States. However, with booking, the US only accounts for 10% of their website traffic, and it is more spread across different countries, mainly in European countries. So even though these companies compete, most of Booking's website visits are overseas compared to the United States. A lot of hotel chains in the United States are extremely popular, with chains like Marriott, Holiday Inn, Hilton, Hampton Inn, and Hawat. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing these correctly, but you know what I mean. So most customers looking to book a hotel is likely to request to stay directly at any one of these chains since they have their own huge promotional and loyalty programs and don't need an online travel agency like Expedia, which is very concentrated in the United States, to make a booking. Even though these chains are listed on Expedia, they can bargain and pay a lower commission since they don't really need an online travel agency to promote their rooms since they are very popular in the United States. Expedia states this on their annual report and says that while the global lodging industry remains fragmented, there has been consolidation in the hotel space among chains as well as ownership groups. In the meantime, certain hotel chains have been focusing on driving direct bookings on their own websites and mobile applications while advertising lower rates than those available on third-party websites as well as incentives such as loyalty programs, increased or exclusive products availability, and complementary benefits. So this situation isn't really the same with booking holdings. Most of their reservations are international and is more concentrated in Europe, and the advantage with booking is that most hotel chains in Europe are independent and don't have the same marketing resources and exposure as the US chains which means they rely more heavily on travel agencies like Booking to promote their hotels. And Booking is able to request larger commissions to promote their rooms on their website. And hotel chains in Europe and other countries will happily pay for this because a room that isn't booked is pretty much wasted inventory. So it's always better to have rooms that are booked than having an empty room since the costs are pretty much the same for running a hotel. And we can see the difference in margins between the two companies, and that is the story there. Airbnb is a great business, but traffic is mostly in the United States, and Airbnb's reservations are mostly in homes and apartments where people can lease out their holiday homes to other people for a few nights. Even though Booking does list alternative property on their platform, while as a matter of fact, most of their listings are actually in homes and apartments, but most of their bookings are in hotels that are outside of the United States. And the main difference is that Airbnb doesn't specialize in hotels. So I think booking doesn't directly compete with Airbnb, and I think they may have a competitive advantage outside of the United States. So looking at the past financial data for the last 10 years, we have sales, operating income, net income, free cash flow, free cash flow per share, and equity. And while well, apart from equity, they all seem to be trending in a positive direction. Operating margins have reduced over time, and this mainly relates to their growing merchant business where they have been collecting payments from customers and remitting that to their suppliers. Gross turnover has been decreasing too, but since this is a software company, most of their property and equipment isn't physical property, it's mainly software that they have capitalized as property and equipment and those investments have grown over time. Oh, and by the way, these numbers are all presented in millions, just to, just to let you know. They have returned a large portion of their free cash flow to their owners, to the shareholders of the company. And this was done in a combination of buybacks and dividends. If we look at the sum of the free cash flow over the past 10 years and the sum of the cash return, 83% of their free cash flow has been returned to their shareholders, meaning us, the owners of the business. We can see how this has reduced the amount of shares over time, and keep in mind that's also presented in millions. So it got around 52 million shares outstanding 10 years ago to 37 at the moment. However, debt has increased over time, and our debt ratios doesn't seem to like the amount of debt that it's holding. Looking at the most recent free cash flow, it looks like it will take around two years to pay off the debt. And this is something to be aware of, 
However, most of the debt are long term with due dates after 2027, but regardless, it is a risk. Return on investor capital is fantastic for this business. It's been well over 20% for most years, and this gives us an indication that management is reinvesting back into the business really well, and this has been consistent, which indicates that they have a competitive advantage as well. Going back to what we were talking about before, I believe their advantage lies in their geographic location outside of the United States. If we look at the growth rates, they are mostly in double digits, which is nice to see. The reason we have an error in the three-year data for free cash flow and equity is because of negative values. So three years ago in 2020, Booking had a negative free cash flow because of the pandemic, and the company is currently sitting in negative equity. So that's why we see those figures with equity at the moment. Now, this is due to what we've seen before with the increase in interest debt over time, and also because they've returned 83% of their cash to owners. And when that happens, that reduces the amount of cash that's on their balance sheet, which also reduces the amount of equity they have. Moving forward, it's always good seeing higher growth rate percentages in the recent one-year, three-year, and five-year growth rates compared to the longer-term growth rates, because it tells us that the rate of growth has been accelerating in recent years. Below, we have our one-year, five-year, and 10-year averages in margins, capital turnover, and return on investor capital. Let's look at the discount cash flow calculator. We have the current year free cash flow. And before I do move on, looking at the historical data, in the latest year, since the 2023 results isn't out yet, these are all just my estimates. So their Q3 report has recently come out, and I've just estimated what what their financial results will look like at the end of the year. So these are all just my estimates. But taking the latest year free cash flow, I always like to be conservative when projecting the rate of growth in the future. And in this example, I'm projecting an 8% growth rate in the first five years and 6% in the latter half. I've chosen these numbers for a couple of reasons. Well, firstly, I believe the company will grow in the next 10 years because of its position in the market and the overall industry is estimated to grow. I've taken the 8% simply because 8% was the lowest growth in the prior 10 years. And also the free cash flow in the current year is also the highest that it's ever been. And this is calculating 8% from the current year. The discount rate is at 10%. So the way this works is we have a normal 8% growth rate at the top from years one to five. And in each year, it discounts it by 10%. And this is because we simply can't guarantee the company will grow by that amount. So we want a margin of safety. We have our terminal value of 20, which is simply the price to free cash flow ratio at the end of year 10. Oh, and the reason why I've got the 6% growth rate from year 6 to 10 is I just simply like to reduce the growth rate in the latter half, since that's just harder to estimate. So the company is carrying $475 million in net debt on the balance sheet, and this leaves us at an intrinsic value per share of 4,296. So we have our additional margin of safety prices, And I like to think of this as a discount on a discount, and we have our prices along with their corresponding percentages. And these are the price ranges that I've come up with after analyzing the company. But anyways, I hope you gained some value from the video. If you did, then please show your support by giving the video a like below and subscribing to the channel, and I'll talk to you as all soon.